Hello and welcome to this presentation on null binding and ancient endangered heritage craft by Emma Boast, archaeological find specialist and null binding master craftsman in York, United Kingdom. Hopefully this presentation today will just give you an insight and overview as to how wide and varied null binding as a fibre craft is across the world. For decades it has been shrouded in a bit of mystery and hidden nuance but hopefully you'll be able to see from some of the education material, museum references and collections that are available out there that actually it's a fascinating craft with many different cultural representations and applications. So let's get going shall we? Just a, a disclaimer to state that this is public presentation and everything that I have touched upon today is available within the uh, public domain. It is for educational purposes. Um, it is collated for such. So if anybody would like to cite anything, I do have a bibliography at the back and everything is um, appropriately recorded as such as well. So yeah, welcome. Um, this presentation today aims to introduce you to this world of null binding as an ancient fibre craft um, and this presentation will be narrated by me and given from an archaeological and practical craft perspective as well. This presentation is going to be about 45 minutes to an hour long. Um, it was given in person to um, the lovely folks from the Northern um, Costume and Textile Society uh, a couple of months ago. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them down in the comments below and I'll get back to you on those as well. So this is just as what's going to be covered in the presentation today. What is null binding? How is null binding different? How do we classify null binding archaeologically? What is Hansen's notation? We'll have a look at then the existing null bound textiles that are around the world. We'll then ask where does that leave null binding as a craft now? And we'll look at that from a UK perspective because it varies for sure within different countries and cultures. Um, and also what you can do to help. And then you can have a browse through some of the sources that are accessible um, and just say final thanks and any questions below in the comments if you have them. So, what is null binding? So, null binding is the English name used throughout the United Kingdom to describe the historical fibercraft technique. It involves using one single needle and using long lengths of yarn, which are then formed into particular stitches to then build up items such as hats, socks, mittens, pouches and bags. It comes from null, which refers to the needle used, and the binding, which refers to the action that you're taking. So this is a linguistic development that has mainly come from Scandinavian influence of the craft within the British Isles. Outside of the British Isles in the UK, there are many different cultural names for null binding. Um, and here are just a few. You've got null binding, null binding, null binding, null kinas, knotless knitting, single needle knitting, null binding, knotted knitting, cross-knit looping, and I apologise for any pronunciations there as well. But each cultural application has its own descriptive term for this particular fibre craft around the world. So it really does make investigating and researching this craft quite challenging. So how is null binding different? Well, null binding is based on a series of um, individual interlocking knots or stitches. You create and lock your stitches as you form and build your textile one stitch at a time. Um, and I think Harma Peening in her paper in 2019 really highlighted it quite well that null binding cannot be made without crossed stitches. So without those crossings of the legs in these stitches, the fabric must have been knitted 
either on needles or on a knitting dolly. So this is just a diagnostic observation from a textile uh, specialist who has stated and investigated this and seen that, yeah, because you're physically locking these stitches in, it's going to create a very diagnostic textile that is very different to knitting um, and crochet or other forms of needlework, which is mainly based on loops that are free flowing. One of the great things about null binding is that null bound textiles don't unravel and they do create very solid and durable textiles. So the garments and the items that you make from them wear very well and last a long time. So all items made from the historically applied null binding technique are mostly made in the round, which means you spiral your textile out from a centrally focused point. This involves learning and understanding several different steps. You need to know the stitch formation that you're creating, the basic technique of the craft. You then need to learn how to manipulate those stitches and increase and decrease in a unified manner. And then you manipulate the stitches even further to create the shape around your items. So with null binding, as is with other fibre crafts, it can become quite easy just to focus on the stitch formation to demonstrate the basic idea of null binding rather than recreating items into fully formed null bound textiles. And I think it's important to note that this has been a problem in the past, whereas folks have demonstrated null binding just to you know, educate and inform people that this craft exists, which is wonderful. But that has then slipped through into historical reenactment and reconstructed items that are not quite constructed in quite the right way because the basic technique and application hasn't quite been learnt fully. So it's important just to note that these are two completely different levels of craftsmanship. Um, as with any skill, there is a, a spectrum of craftsmanship too based on those that are making these items. So that's just something to be mindful of, even when we're looking at archaeological examples of null binding too. So as an archaeological find specialist, this is very much my wheelhouse of um, how do we classify null binding archaeologically. And there are many set forms and structures that we look at when we're trying to figure out what kind of textile we are actually looking at. So I'll be looking at the shape um, of the object, whether it's a full um, object or whether it's fragmentary. I'll be taking dimensions and measurements of the object. I'll then be looking at the form and the structure. Um, do we think it's nail binding versus any other type of fibre craft, is it knitting, crochet, um, to try and understand the basic craft skill that this item has been composed of. I'll then look at the function is it an identifiable object like a sock or a mitten or are we just looking at fragmented textile remains and obviously that does impact on what kind of interpretation and and um, identification we're able to do as well i'll then look at the context so where and how was it found um, whether that be from a, a, like a cultural perspective, what kind of culture was it found within, what kind of date and time period is it found within, um, the depth, was it found with any uh, other datable material within the archaeological sequence or was it set within its own archaeological sequence as well. So there's quite a few things to consider. Um, we're also looking at like the preservation level of the object itself. Is it bad? Is it poor? Is it fair? Is it good? You know, is it going to deteriorate if you touch it too much? Does the object need to be conserved, you know, in some manner after assessment? And are we going to have to try and stabilize this object a bit more and make sure that it's um, supported and survives if we're going to keep it and or display it as well? So we also have to think about what stitch group it might belong to. Is it like a, a form of simple null binding um, where we're just dealing with simple interlocking loops through the textile? Are we looking at more complex null binding where we're utilising multiple loops? 
um, normally two to be able to change the depth of the textile that you're creating as well as the the breadth of the textile to make um, creating this object even you know faster and um, sturdier or are we looking at more advanced type bits of nail binding where we are looking at quite complex stitches where three or more uh, loops are used to create really, really thick textiles, dense textiles, mostly up in the Arctic regions um, in the north um, and also uh, for looking at what kind of forms and cultural representations these might represent as well. So we're also trying to look if we can see if we can an identifiable stitch present as well. Um, is the textile preserved enough to identify a particular nail bound stitch? Of course, this depends on how and where it was found and the level of preservation again. But sometimes what tends to happen, obviously, if an object such as um, a wool mitten, nail bound mitten, has been in the ground for over a thousand years, it's gone to gone quite a lot of stresses, a lot of pressures and compactions within the soil over time. Um, and that will have an impact on the actual object itself. So can we identify if the stitches are, are there? And if so, is it part of a particular recognisable uh, stitch group um, to that particular period? Or is the textile too um, compacted or felted over to be able to see that? So that's what we're looking for. I mentioned this a little bit earlier about the date. Is it datable based on all of these things above um, to be able to give a, a time period for this object? And I think archaeologically, a lot of folks uh, tend to think that um, find specialists, we can just kind of look at an object and go, ah, that's that's the specific date. It dates to this date. And in some cases that can happen with certain objects of material culture. But what we tend to see is that we get um, a, a range. We'll give a window that these objects most likely sit within, within that timeline um, of cultural and archaeological interactions. So um, date is important. Um, and then, of course, we have to think about what is its basic notation um, and when we talk about a notation um, all null bound archaeological material is currently notarized based on, based on Hansen's notation which is a way of describing the internal creation and structure of the um, archaeological textile itself. Um, it's something that was created um, in the 1980s. It has been applied to archaeological material and it is useful but as you will see if you read and research it around it wider, there are pros and cons to this notation. It's not exhaustive, it's a bit limited in some ways, but it's what fibre um, and textile archaeologists have uh, deemed a good um, methodology to utilise to help classify this type of material. So that's, that's what we use. So I suppose it's important to ask what is Hansen's notation? And this is what I was just briefly describing. Um, so you might have seen when researching nile binding, these funny little codes where we have UU-0002F2. Um, and a lot of people are like, what are they? So this was developed in the early 19, um, 1990s. It started in the 80s by Hansen, who was a, a textile specialist and historian. And he wanted to be able to apply mathematical strategy to classify nile bound textiles very much in a similar way as to how knitting and crochet patterns had developed. Um, so he was going based on what already existed from other fiber crafts and seeing if he could form and create something that was akin to that with null binding as well. So just to break it down for you, um, it, all of this describes the motion of the needle as the needle is your main tool within this um, fiber craft process. So the U represents the under, the O represents the over, the dash or the slash represents a change in direction, and then your F1, F2, B1, B2, MD, M1, MD, M2 is a placement of the connection or the joining stitch. So whether the needle is coming in 
from the front or from the back or from the middle of the stitch and adjoining as well. So as you can see, yeah, it's quite specific. Um, and obviously when you're looking at archaeological material, some of this is more obvious um, than others. And most of the time it's probably best to get this material looked at under uh, SEM, which is scanning electron microscopy. And um, then you can have a, a closer look under a microscope and actually see uh, what kind of material you are looking at and stitch formation. So archaeologically, null winding will also often be described based on the location of the city that they were found in or where the museum collection has retained them. Uh, and this is quite a common theme um, for sort of like textile history that has occurred. Um, most people um, in the public will also know Nile Bind items based on their location name, like the York Stitch Viking Sock, for example, um, or the Coppergate Sock, um, with the then added Hansen notation afterwards um, for those in archaeology or specialist um, researchers uh, want extra clarity, you'll then get the Hansen notation of that particular um, object noted underneath as well. So including as much information as possible is the most important thing really. Um, and I have to note that this is still a very active um, research and discipline uh, study going on around the world regarding null binding. There's a few of us, it's not mainstream and for sure, um, but Heimer Pining again in 2019, um, she re recently amended some of Hansen's notation to include loop numbers as well, just to help with com defining complex stitches with more than one loop. Um, so, yeah, there is suggestions and evolutions and some people, some specialists find this useful, some specialists don't find this useful. But what we're trying to do is from an object that is from a, a, a time period past removed and fast removed, we're trying to create a bit of a standardised process to then be able to classify other archaeological material that might be similar, um, of similar shape, form and function to other Nile bound items as well. So let's have a look at some existing Nile bound textiles from around the world. Um, and some of my earliest interactions first started with some of the Danish material um, when I first um, encountered Nile binding many, many years ago now. Um, one of the best preserved and, and earliest pieces of Nile bound textile comes from Tyrinvig, um in Denmark, which is uh, an early submerged uh, Mesolithic settlement from the Ertebol culture and dates to around 4200 BC. Um, it was found in the settlement context and as you can see from the, the image opposite it is just a fragmented piece that survives but it is part of the simple looping forms of null binding. So this particular example has one loop, one, continu one continuous loop or a uh, stitch um, with a double inner core structure so it's more rigid. Um, and it has been suggested rather than this being a piece of uh, like clothing accessory or garment textile, it could even possibly be a shape and a form of a basket so or a vessel of some description. So this is where uh, null binding and other related craft skills such as basketry and net making um, do kind of have overlapping or similar characteristics even though they're different crafts themselves. So this particular stitch um, is known within the textile world as the single Danish stitch. Very, very simple. And it is also made um, from plant fibres. This example is made from hemp. So this is the thing. It's not just um, wool um, that can be utilised in nail binding. You can utilise, um, there are cotton examples, there are hemp nettle uh, examples and also some cow hair examples and horse hair examples from Scandinavia so um, yeah varied variety of different yarns that you can utilize. This next piece um, is from Bokhild which is a, an archaeological site in Denmark as well and um, this was found um, in a burial context so as you can see very small fragmented remains dates to around circa 
3400 BC and these textiles were found in fragments across two graves. So again, simple looping form, one loop repeated around in a spiral. It is very difficult to determine what kind of object these fragments would have belonged to, sadly. All we can tell is that it is indeed, again, a single Danish stitch variety and it was made of fine nettle fibres. So possibly part of a garment, seems as we're looking at a burial context, but it's very difficult to provide an accurate interpretation for this, sadly. Next, we're going to go into a, a different part of the world and look at the Tarim Beret style hat from Wupu, China. Um, and this particular object was found um, in a region of China uh, in the in a cemetery where many, many other um, family groups were buried that date to around circa 1000 BC, which is the early Bronze Age in China. And it dates to the Shangzhou dynasty periods. Um, or a lot of these burials, it's important to say, are of quite high status individuals. So elaborate clothing and costume and textiles and hats and accessories. It's quite prevalent within this grouping um, of people when they were buried but also this object is made out of the simple looping as well so very very similar um simple looping one repeated stitch that we have seen from some of the comparative material um from denmark however you can see the way that the artistic representation has been created with this item is with extremely fine two-ply um wool yarn um, and they have changed the directional pattern um, of this um, particular object, which is incredibly um, intricate. So it just denotes the very, very high level of um, skill that this particular Nile binder was applying to such a very specialist object back then. Um, it's also important to note that there are um, other examples of um, Nile bound hat from China as well. They call them onion forms um, and they are indeed again spiralled out um, from the top and it's shaped down around around the head as well. Um, so they're very unique. They're a very unique um, collection of archaeological materials uh, for Nile binding and very culturally distinct too, which is nice to see. We then have um, another um, set of objects talking about culturally distinct we have our egyptian socks um and these egyptian socks date to circa 250 to 420 ad um it's important to note that while they're, although they are culturally egyptian during that time um in egypt it's being um mainly um, administrated over by the Roman Empire. So it is the Coptic sort of Roman Egyptian period um, and the intermingling of those two cultures that is going on at this time. Um, these particular socks were excavated in Egypt during the early 19th century. Because of this, sadly, the context is not known as to, to where they came from. Um, but these are also simple looping um, varieties of stitch but rather than having just one loop and one continuous loop, the needle actually pierces through two stitch stitches in one. And that's what creates this very distinct ribbing and almost like a cross knit effect. And it's I think this particular stitch, this Coptic stitch, is one that has confused a lot of people, whether it be... Uh, fibre historians or fibre crafters trying to figure out what is nile binding knitting crochet etc uh, because yeah torn in its purposes this does look like very simple knitting um, however as I've just described it is very clearly made just with one single needle and picking up two stitches rather than one in this particular stitch formation so I think that's that's pretty fascinating and this pair of socks have been made from two ply wool fibers so again very very fine um, so at the moment we're seeing quite fine textiles being created um, in Nile binding and as you can see they have lasted and been conserved wonderfully. <laughs>
Next, coming through into more of uh, my period of specialism, and we're looking at the Oslo Stitch Mitten from Norway, which dates to around circa 900 to 1000 AD. And within um, the time frame of archaeology around this um, particular region, that dates to the late Iron Age in the Viking period in Norway. It was excavated in 1926 in the old town area of Oslo when they were doing um, excavations and renovations. Um, and it was found within a settlement context that they were then encountering. So this was Oslo stitch would be considered um, a complex looping. So you're utilizing two thumb loops to create and form this particular stitch and depth of textile. Um, and this item was made from a very short stapled um, Z spun clockwise spun yarn. Um, and as you can see, sadly, we've only got partial bit of the thumb that survived and it has uh, disintegrated in the in the join between that and the palm. So. But other than that, it's quite a it is quite a nice example. You can still see the stitch formations quite clearly. Uh, somebody had lost their mitten. Now we're talking on to something that I am very very familiar with. Um, obviously living in York and working in York, um, the York Stitch Sock is the UK's um, premier narbine item if you like and this dates to circa 900 to 1000 AD it is from the Anglo-Scandinavian occupation of the city of uh, Jorvik uh, in the Viking period and it was excavated uh, during the Coppergate excavation between 1976 and 81 uh, so it was found in a settlement context it is complex looping again because we are utilizing uh, one thumb loop to create uh, this particular stitch formation um, and it's made from very short stapled wool fibre um, and it's also in a z-spun clockwise um, direction that it has been created that yarn. It's again very fine two-ply yarn and it's quite light in colour, possibly a, a, it would have originally been like a, a white beigey brown um, colour of the sock but when it was uh, put under the scanning electron microscopy um, the evidence um, appeared around the trim of the ankle which showed that uh, there was madder dyed um, wool that had been used to create a very detailed red trim around that ankle of this particular slipper sock so that's quite um, quite fascinating to see here the next item that we'll go on to is the Anharstadir mitten from Iceland, um, which dates from circa 900 to 1100 AD. So this is an Icelandic Danish object uh, from the Viking period, however, and we're talking about the cultural interactions there where in the early Viking period, a lot of the Viking peoples, so to speak, were coming across from Denmark. Um, and settling the landscape. Um, it was found in uh, the eastern part of Iceland in the 19th century when excavations, uh, home building excavations, were going on at Anhestetir. Um, but its exact context is unknown, sadly. Um, this object is very large um, and is made up of very complex looping. Um, it's Oslo stitch forming as well. Um, and it's also made up from Z-spun um, short stapled yarn. We can see from its preservation and how it's been conserved as well, it's in a really, really good condition. It is made, however, of coarse wool, uh, worsted weight wool. Um, and when they did SEM on, on this object, it did reveal colour pigments visible. So what they did to create a bit of unique differentiation on this object was... Um, to create and utilize natural colors of different wools and then create that in a banded striped fashion um, which is rather rather nice now this next piece is um, an object from from dublin in ireland um, the dublin stitch fragment is only a very small piece um, that survives um, and it dates to around circa 900 to 1000 AD. It is from the Hiberno-Norse culture Viking period, um, 
in in Ireland. It was found and excavated in the Fish Shambles Street and Wood Key excavations between 1987 and 88. So again, it's from a, a Viking Age um, settlement context. Um, and it is also thought to be um, part of the complex looping system and utilising two thumb loop twists, a little similar to York stitch type, but it's very difficult to figure out what kind of stitch formation and um, actual characteristics of this object are because currently the location of this object within the collections um, in the National Museum of Ireland are unknown. Um, so as far as I am aware, um, this illustration from Pritchard's and Wallace's um, Viking Age Dublin um, book is the only visual evidence to say that this object um, existed. Um, whether it still exists is a, is a question for researchers to try and find, and maybe a re-evaluation of this object would provide further um, information on that as well. But again, you can see this is made from short stapled wool fibre, uh, said spun yarn, and sadly because it is a fragmented piece, we don't really know um, what kind of accessory or object this uh, textile fragment belonged to. Then we have moving on to um, the Jurelustari Mitten, which is from Finland, and this dates to um, circa 1000 to 1100 AD. And we're looking at Finnish, Norwegian, Swedish, Viking Age culture, rural interactions going on during the Viking period for this item. Um, so this fragment um, was found within a grave context. Um, and it is actually part of the complex looping system because there were three thumb loops utilised to create this particular particular stitch. And it is the traditional finish stitch. Um, you can see that we've got quite a, a wide um, stitch pattern. Um, and it is also, again, made out of short stapled wool fibred zed spun yarn um, in a clockwise direction. But the fascinating thing with the Uralis Thari Mitten, there's been many... Uh, different interpretations and reconstructions of this object because it is very obvious that there are bands of distinct dyed yellow, red and blue woolen yarn. So dyed yarns had been utilised quite distinctly to create this colour differentiation on this mitten, which would have looked lovely. Uh, next is St Simeon's hat from Trier in Germany. Um, it dates to around circa 1000 AD and we are looking at a German-Danish ecclesiastical um, cultural setting. Uh, it does date to the Viking Age period more broadly at the end of the Viking period, but it does survive in this good standard, mainly because it has survived in a um, Trier treasury. So it has part of being kept as a reliquary object and housed very carefully um, because it is a, a Christian religious object as well. Um, it's made out of um, sim com complex looping and two thumb loops um, in the Saltdale stitch. It's um, created from short stapled wool natural uh, brown fibres in Zed Spun Yarn. But the important thing to note, as you can see, is that there is a band of silk around uh, the crown of the the actual um and the brim of the actual hat and then it is very finely trimmed above that in the between the interface of the null binding and the silk with tablet braid so a very fine hat indeed we then have um, St Germain stockings from France circa 1000 to 1100 AD um, these are from Norman Danish ecclesiastical setting again, dating more broadly to the end of the Viking Age period, and again also a reliquary object. Um, sadly at present this object's um, location is unknown, we only have this reference from uh, Schmeding in 1976 to show that this object um, survived. It is also made out of complex three loop uh, stitches, again made from the finished stitch, but this is very interesting because this object is made from linen. Um, so as you can see, very tiny stitches, very fine stitches, and these stockings were actually then utilised in, in past as like vestment covers, so they were found nestled up on top of um, other religious objects as well. So next 
um, what I'd like to touch upon is some more diagnostic items from further afield. And here we're looking at the Anastas ancestral Pablo Anastasi shoe shock in uh, interpretations um, from uh, Arizona in the United States. So these date to around circa 1100 to 1300 AD um, and the Pueblo period. And these were found within the grave context of the uh, Mummy 2 cave. These simple looping um, stitches are repeated in the single Danish form, which is intriguing and interesting. And they are actually made from cotton yarn, packed internally with animal fur fibre for warmth and support. So the sole is made from woven and plated uh, yucca plant fibres. So this is a really unique and interesting cultural variation of null binding, as it's utilising other elements and, and fibres and craft materials to create this shoe sock um, from this period. Then we're going on to the Vasa ship coin pouch, um, which was found in Sweden. And this dates to circa 1600 to 1700 AD. So it's a Swedish cultural representation, and it was found on the top gun deck of the Vasa warship in Stockholm Holba um, during this excavation. Um, it was absolutely incredible what they found and um, preserved within this warship. Uh, but this complex um, looping form is formed in the Oslo stitch as you can see it's only a very small fragment that has survived but it's nice to see the very diagnostic bits of nail binding there um, and yeah just a very small little portable coin pouch object that has been made from that um, sort of 17th 18th century period then we're moving forward into null-bound embroidered mittens from Sweden, which date to circa 1800 to 1900 AD. So we're looking at 19th to 20th century examples here in Sweden. Um, these were handed into the collection from a, a family in the 20th century, and they are made um, in complex looping with two thumb loops in an Oslo stitch pattern. And as you can see, the, the null binding here is very, very fine, very dense, very unique. And it's made from fine tube line natural untied wool as well. And then you can see what has happened is they have overlaid that with red wool embroidery details um, around the body and the cuff um, of the mitten as well, which is very, very pretty indeed. So I guess this kind of brings us back to what do all these lovely um, archaeological examples of null binding mean for, for modern null binders and archaeology uh, research moving forward um, but the important things to impart really is that null binding has been going on for a long period of time continuously more so in other cultures and countries uh, in some places than others however now we are starting to understand a bit more as to the timeline and the variations of the different um, early bronze age and um, Roman and Viking Age and medieval applications of null binding too. So hopefully in the years to come, with more further research, we'll be able to build a better narrative for null binding as a world craft. But so where does that leave null binding as a craft now within the UK, from a UK point of view and perspective? Well, it's still not as visible or well known as a craft as knitting or crochet, that's for sure. I frequently encounter people sort of saying that they've never heard of null binding. It's a surprise to them. They're fascinated by it. Um, but it's still not well known and needs to certainly be made more um, widely known, I think, uh, which is part of what I do um, with Nidfeld and Null Binding is providing that education and, and academic um, articles to help support and provide awareness for Null Binding within the UK. Um, but the academic and museum information isn't widely accessible for the general public or for people to engage with necessarily. It is sort of gatekeeped a little bit um and you know a bit more sharing and accessibility with this i think will benefit the craft um and the historical research a bit more for sure <laughs>
Um, but the problem that a lot of people find from a practical point of view is learning to nail bind itself physically as a craft does come with various pitfalls. So you get variations within actual sort of like technical understanding what people how people understand nail binding to uh, take place from a te- technical and technique point of view. Um, and obviously people's um, variations in teaching application and the resources they're using and how they're imparting that information varies as well. Um, but in the UK, we're really fortunate because now that it is listed and protected um, as an endangered heritage craft within the UK with the Heritage Craft Association, um, it does mean that we can slowly, you know, provide a little bit of a buffer and a support for this ancient textile craft. So it is an endangered heritage craft in the UK. And there's several other um, countries um, around the world where it has also been protected and granted um uh, endangered heritage craft uh, status as well so it's not a mainstream craft people struggle very um you know a lot <laughs> to create um, a business out of this craft and make this as a mainstream um profession so yeah support your nail binders um and that's the point there is a limited number of of craft specialists and craft people nail binding um, as well as doing the research too, people sort of dip in and out of both. Um, so what I have tried to do over the years is just provide that stable bridge between practical craft and reconstructive crafts in null binding based on the archaeological evidence and then also providing that um, practical guide with my null binding for beginners books and resources and then supplementing that with free presentations and articles uh, that people can read and access to learn a bit more so what can you do to help null binding um, as a, an ancient heritage craft um, the most important thing is just learn give it a go um, as with any craft skill some people like it some people will tune to it quicker than others but you're never going to know if you don't give it a try the challenge is finding an accessible resource for beginners that works for you and like i say i have put a lot of time and effort into making my resources as clear and as simple and as accessible as possible for people so you're more than welcome to utilize mine or you're more than welcome to obviously utilize any others that you come across um as you explore your nail binding journey but read and do a bit of research yourself about these fascinating finds. You can go to the museums um, themselves and go and have a look at the objects. You can request to have an appointment if it's available or if it's appropriate from these museums as well to go and learn more yourself. Um, but please do support individual nail binding craftspeople as well that take the time to demonstrate or make replica objects because as you'll start to learn when you start your journey, it is a very... Um, time-consuming process it's a skill that is learned over many many years of practice and time so yeah please please support people that put a lot of their love and time and effort and passion into creating um these lovely nail bound objects but more importantly just tell people about this craft share this information you know tell people that it's it's not just a viking age uh, craft it spans multiple different time periods multiple different cultures um and there is so much more that we can learn from null binding as a craft too so with that i think i will finish this presentation um i'll give you an opportunity to have a read through uh, some of the bibliography so that you can have a look at some good resources if should you'd like to go and follow up um your own research and investigate further but um yeah thank you very much for listening and for your kind attention and if you have any further questions um regarding um archaeological examples of nail binding please do pop them pop your questions in the comments below uh, please do give this video a like or share because it then helps boost it and send it out into the ether and the world for people to learn more about this um, ancient endangered heritage craft. Have a lovely day. Thank you.